Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, I want to take a quick second to talk about Alltech. Alltech is a global feed ingredient company delivering smarter, more sustainable solutions for agriculture. Alltech's diverse portfolio of products and services improves the health and performance of livestock, and their technical support teams work with you to provide the best nutritional fit for your operation. Contact your local feed supplier or your local Alltech rep to discuss options in your area. You can learn more about Alltech by checking out the link in the show notes. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and today we are going to be visiting with Vance Crow. Vance is going to be visiting with us about legacy. We're going to dive into the depths of what a family legacy is, why it's important to know what it is, and how to record that and pass that down to for generations to come. And so a little bit about Vance. Vance is a communications strategist that has worked for corporations and international organizations around the world. He's spoken before more than 250,000 people answering questions about some of the most sophisticated and controversial technologies in the modern age. He has worked for organizations as varied as the World Bank, to Monsanto, to the U.S. Peace Corps, and even was a deckhand on an ecotourism ship. So he has quite the vast variety uh, or a lot of experiences to say the least. But the reason Vance is on the show today is he's the founder of Legacy Interviews, which is a service to privately record and file stories of either individuals or couples so that they can be passed down to future generations. And so while you are listening to this conversation with Vance today, something I want you to reflect on during or after the interview would be how you can make more time to ask questions and spend time with the senior generation to really learn from them and understand um, what they went through and how they've gotten to where they are today. So with that, we are going to dive into the conversation with Vance. I do want to remind you that if you are interested in starting your own podcast and just diving in as soon as possible, go to the link in the description and you can access the kickstart your podcast workbook, which is a workbook designed to help you start your podcast um, on your own time sooner rather than later so that you can make your own impact, share your own stories, ask questions, and really get your voice out there because it matters. But with that, let's hear from Vance. Well, Vance, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be on the podcast this morning. I'm a huge fan of your podcast. So right away, I'm going to tell listeners if once you finish listening to this podcast, go check out the Vance Crow podcast. He covers a wide variety of topics, um, some controversial topics that'll really make you think too. And you have some great guests on there, Vance. But today we're going to be talking about what you do with legacy interviews, which correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm understanding this. They're not just for people in ag to record family history, but it's really for anyone. And it's, I really think it's an interesting topic because I talk about transition planning and working with family on the show, but this is really a new topic for the show that I'm excited to discuss. And I really think would be beneficial for so many people. So before we dive into exactly what legacy interviews are and have a conversation about what family legacy is, Can you kind of start off a little bit and talk about who you are as a person briefly? I know you've done a lot of things in your life so far, so that might be hard to keep it brief, but introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Well, I'm really glad to be here, Shay. Thank you so much for having me on and the kind introduction. I am a a regular guy that lives in St. Louis, Missouri, and I moved here about 12 years ago after my wife and I got married. I had been working at the World Bank which um, when I went into the World Bank, I thought this was the absolute top of the mountain. It's a, for people that don't know, it's the cousin to the UN, and it's kind of where a lot of uh, international aid work gets done and big planning. But when I got in there, I realized that this place that I had been led to believe, this kind of shining city on a hill, it wasn't. And all of my work that had led me to getting to this point, whether it was being in the Peace Corps or working on a house or working in public radio or having a graduate degree, like it didn't prepare me for the staggering defeat of being in a place I didn't wanna be. 
So fortunately, I met a woman that became my wife. Both of us looked around Washington, D.C. and said, I don't want to be here. Do you want to be here? And uh, we decided that we would move to St. Louis. My wife was an aerospace engineer, and she wanted to become a physical therapist. And there is an amazing physical therapy uh, department here in St. Louis. And people kind of wonder, like, well, how do you make that jump? But it's all really about the physics of movement. And so my wife was just moving from making airplanes move through um, uh, air and now making humans move through air more effectively. So I ended up coming to St. Louis. I took a job uh, ultimately with Monsanto and became the director of millennial engagement where that job and its hilarious job title was really about all those people that have strong feelings about GMOs and pesticides. My job was to go out and talk to all those people. And uh, I had a wonderful experience doing that. It was a very intense job, very creative. Uh, it really involved uh, listening to people and understanding where they were coming from so that that way you could convey something back to them and try and change hearts and minds. And then ultimately Bear bought Monsanto. And so I stayed there for about a year and then I left and uh, I was running my own company. I give talks around the country about um, negotiations, about getting through conflict, about handling your critics. And then I started this company called Legacy Interviews. And Legacy Interviews is where I sit down with either an individual or couples to record their life stories so that future generations have the opportunity to know their family history. And like you alluded to, this isn't just for farmers, but I can tell you like 80% of my business is people that are coming in from all over the United States, even Canada, to record these. And I think it's because ag has a special connection with their family, with their heritage, with legacy, and they understand time in a way that maybe people in the city don't have the same understanding. So I wanna take a step back where did you get your passion for this legacy component? Like what made you kind of want to start these legacy interviews? Well, the whole thing started almost as an accident. And I think a lot of entrepreneurship is this way where I was doing my podcast because I needed to have new ideas. If you're going to go out and give speeches, you can't just go out and talk about the same thing all the time. You have to be around people. You have to be around ideas. And uh, I had a listener one time say, hey, I'm driving through your town. I have a book I'd like you to read. Would you mind if I stop by your, your house? Because that's where my studio is. And I said, no, come on by. So we lined it up and uh, he comes by and his son is with him. And his son, as soon as he hears my voice, his eyes get really big. And he's like, oh, my gosh, you're the guy on the radio. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, yeah, do you want to record an interview? And the kid was like, yes. He like was barging into my house ready to go. And I asked his dad and he said, yeah. So we went downstairs and uh, we put on the headphones and we turn on the cameras and the lights and he, he's six. So his legs are like dangling off the side of the chair. And I end up asking him questions that a six-year-old could answer. Like, what do you think your dad does at work all day? Or what food do you wish mom let you eat more of? Or tell me about your best friend. And the kid sits there and he is like, he is on meet the press, right? He is like focused and attention and wants to give great answers. So we record the interview. I end up packaging it up and um, mailing an interview to his dad. And, uh, and I said, play it for him sometime when you're in the truck. So uh, a few weeks later, the dad calls me up and he said, hey man, the other day I was at uh, a party and we were playing a game. And uh, a question came up, if your house were on fire and you could only grab one thing, what would it be? He said, I knew instantly it was the interview that you did with my son. And I thought a lot about it. And I think it's because one, if I had tried to record this interview with him, um, he wouldn't have answered the questions in the same way. The fact that it was somebody on the outside got him to answer things differently. And two, I can't go back and get it again. And so I don't know what you should do with this, but I think you should do something. So I went out on my podcast and I said, hey, it's a few weeks before Christmas. If anybody wants me to interview your parents, let me know. And I thought I was going to get like two or three, but I got so many, I couldn't get them all done before Christmas. And that's when I realized wow, people have a lot that they want to make sure these future generations know and understand. And uh, when they try and do it themselves, there's something really hard. It's like staring at a white blank page. And so I could really offer something that would really help people out. And that's how the business started to grow. So with that, what, what is legacy to families? What do you think that word means? What is legacy? Wow. You know, that is a great question. Um, I used to think that legacy was about, you know, kind of the statue idea or the monument, right? Like our family 
um, stands for this and look how we were able to put, put something up so that future people would know and understand about it. But now having done hundreds of interviews, gosh, I don't think I've ever thought of this before, but as I'm answering this question, as I think more deeply about it, I, I think your legacy in the same way that your genetics conforms like how tall are you? How do you walk? What, what do you look like? Even probably impacts your smile. Your legacy is the part of you that gets handed down that was hard won through experience. And it, it is the things that your family um, represents and it's how your family handles problems uh, when they inevitably come up. And so to have a family legacy is a way of understanding how do we as a group of people handle ourselves uh, in the face of uncertainty and change and and all the problems that can come up in this world. I I appreciate the response uh, for being a little quick on your feet there, because that is a deep question. And I think legacy could mean something different to each of us in some regard. And like you mentioned earlier, family legacy in agriculture, it does just almost have this Maybe we as agriculturists have more of a desire to know it. Maybe we're told to desire it in a sense. So I guess with that, with some of your clients who are your ag clients, what has been the impact of them going through this process? Like how has it, have you gotten feedback on how it's impacted their families, whether like to understand like what the older generation's perspective is and the older generation stories, what's kind of been the impact on families? It has been profound. You know, when I started this whole business, I really thought that it would be like, hey, do you want to record your stories, mom and dad or grandma and granddad? And they would be like, yeah, I'd love to. But what I came to realize was that people take this experience very seriously. And they they stop and they ask themselves, what did I do in my life, right? What am I going to record? What do I have to pass down? And for a lot of people, even people that have led uh, great lives or lives where they've had to triumph over some of their challenges and vices, that's a scary thing to do. And so um, I've realized over time that people are facing something that's kind of uh, a, a little bit intimidating, right? I'm going to have this recorded. This is how people will remember me. What if I say the wrong thing? What if my interpretation of the way a story happened isn't the way that it is for everyone else? What happens if I say something um, that hurts somebody's feelings and then they have that resting forever on that? But once you get people over that hurdle, that challenge of they are scared of saying something and they start talking, there is something really amazing that happens, which is people start reflecting on the times in their lives where that they don't normally go back to. And this could be uh, their childhood and thinking about their parents and the struggle that their parents went through to raise them. It could be vices that they faced and overcame or really struggled with. It could be the, the loss of, of children or a marriage. It could also be the pride that they have and the, and the vacations that they took and the presents that they gave. But people have this really amazing experience because they don't ever actually go back and revisit it. So if I'm recording a mom and a dad, you will often see them look at each other and be like, we did get through that bankruptcy okay. We did do that. And of course they intuitively know that they did it, but until you go back and tell these stories and you get to take the, the, I, the context that you had when you were experiencing it, and now you get to apply wisdom to it, they now get to experience this in a very different way. So I've heard from dozens, maybe hundreds of guests that oftentimes parents after they're done, you know, dad wants to take his first vacation in 40 years, or mom is finally willing to move off the farm she's wanted to do for a long time and move in with her sister in Minneapolis. And I think that that has to do with by looking back on people's lives, they often get to close a chapter and then open a new one. And, and I think that it's a really important part of telling stories, which is why I always say, if we're not going to be the ones to do your legacy interview, that's okay. Make sure you're asking your family so that they can tell stories so that they can have this experience of being able to recontextualize all those things that happened to them. It's almost like by giving them a chance to reflect, you're almost allowing them to leave like a survival mode they still might be hanging on to if they did go through all those hard times. 
I think that's right. I mean, so, so, so many times people will tell me right before, like, ah, you know, I, I had this thing happen. I don't know if we're, I don't know if I'm going to want to talk about it or not. And then when they talk about it, they realize like, this thing does not have the hold over me that it did when I was experiencing it. I just never had a reason to go back there. And they certainly never had a time when they got to talk about it with a person like, I have no judgment. I'm curious. I want to know what's going on with people. I'll be listening and asking, uh, you know, try and ask questions that sh that demonstrate that I want to know more. But like, you're never going to hear that I thought you did something wrong or that that was the bad decision. You, like, because I don't, I now know enough to know that I don't have any judgment. And I think that it's very rare that people get to tell deeply personal stories without having somebody say, oh, that's what you did. And I think that that helps people get past things that they weren't able to get past when they were just holding those thoughts in their head. Yeah, I, I'd be interested. So as we've talked before, I kind of did my own version of legacy interviews before I even know what you knew what you were doing. I did them in college because I'm almost I'm like 24 and a half or whatever, but I, I have all four grandparents still alive. So when I was still in college, I was like, man, I have all four grandparents alive. They're all still active on the ranch. Like they've slowed down obviously, but there are a lot of stories there. And that's something that both sides of my family have been really good at as far as recording their own family history, like having it written in a book. And I was always the little kid who would prefer to just sit and listen to my grandpa and his sisters, like tell their stories growing up, but no one ever recorded it. And one thing is, you know, they'll tell stories about my great grandparents and I'm like, well, it would be nice if I could hear their voice or like, I have my great grandma's name as my middle name. And it's like, it just would be nice to, you know, if I would have been able to feel like I could know her through hearing her voice or anything like having an interview itself. So I did it my own on, I did it for my own family and my cousins were surprised. They were like, I can't believe you got grandpa to sit down and say that. And I was kind of surprised too, but I would be really interested to see how it would be different if an outside source would have done it because there is still like, I'm the next generation. So there was still some context where I was like, well, maybe they're sharing more with me, but also it's like, they could be sharing less because they might feel more attached to what they're telling me about what happened. Yeah, I think that who interviews you really does make a big difference on how that all plays out. And I don't think that you would want to say that one is better than the other, um, because I think like within a family, you might hear somebody's name and, and be like, oh, I, I want to know more about that person. I'm going to pull on that thread. And that context really matters to you and, and mm -hmm. to the rest of your family. And for an outsider, that's very hard to do. On the flip side, uh, we, we often think that parents and grandparents are fully adjusted and they're, they're, they're like, oh, I'm totally confident in who I am. But oftentimes like parents will talk about decisions that they made when they were parenting was one of the questions I asked was when you were raising your kids, did you ever have a tough decision to make one that you didn't know what the, the right way to be a good parent was? And parents really struggle with this. And, and it's something that they think about a lot. And, you know, I wonder if you were sitting there across from the daughter that you kept home from senior prom because, you know, she broke a rule, if you would be able to explain yourself in the same way uh, as you could to an outsider. And it really just depends on the person and the context, but who, who interviews, I think, changes the outcome of it, no question. Increased profitability and informed management decisions go hand in hand. Herd Dog is a data analytics company that makes it possible for cattle producers to collect herd information efficiently. Their smart ear tag monitors cattle 24 7. Think of it as a Fitbit for cattle. Herd Dog fits the needs of a variety of operations as it can find sick animals days before humans can detect illness, and it also identifies which cows are in heat. Best of all, the tags have a high visibility light to help you sort out which cattle you are looking for. Head to their website, which is linked in the show notes, or contact them for a consultation to see how Herd Dog can work for you. Herd Dog is spelled H E R D D O G G. That's two D's and two G's. So I'm curious, I'm assuming you've interviewed a variety of ages of people. So do you notice, like, if they're closer to, like, you know, 90 or 80, are they more or less open than those who might be closer to their 
70s or maybe if you're interviewing people in their 60s or 50s are there certain age gaps who are more open to discussing things and some that are maybe a little more closed off or do you think it's more personality dependent that's a great question i think there's a huge dose of that is personality right it's just like are you an extrovert or an introvert are you the type of person that likes telling stories or not but i i will say this like um so i the the people that I typically interview are around 55 all the way up to 85. Some we've done older, certainly. But um, one thing I always tell people is like, because sometimes if you say oh, I'm 55, I'm not ready for my legacy interview. And I always say your stories about your childhood are not going to get sharper as you go along, right? Your stories about what your parents were like, what growing up was like, what your farmhouse was like, those aren't going to change. And, but what happens as people get older is there's a smoothing out, I think, of what were the emotional high and low points that you want to make sure you capture because they shaped who you were. And as you get older and older, some of that smoothing out uh, happens just as a function of wisdom and as a function of growing older. And so um, for better or for worse, I think that a lot of times older people have trouble looking back and thinking about the specific highlights or lowlights that they, they want to, you know, uh, talk about. That, that being said, um, there is something really beautiful about 70 and above, and that is that people begin to lose their politeness filter. <laughs> and if if they were a really nice person um, and uh, but that was like just kind of a facade, then all of a sudden you realize like, no, that like this is a much rougher person than I remember. But sometimes you meet people and they are just the happiest, nicest people, but they no longer are concerned or mapping. What is this person thinking about what I'm saying? So they just say it. And so there's much less, uh, I think, internal dialogue going on with the older people. So. In all of this, there's there's trade-offs as you go up the age scale on uh, how, how it turns out as an interview. I will say that is has been one of the fun things watching my grandparents age is like the grandparent you remember when you're little and they're teaching you manners and how to be nice and treat people. And then once you're an adult and they're like, yeah, all my grandkids are grown up and adults like filter gone. <laughs> <laughs> And that filter is something that, uh, you know, comprises a lot of your personality. And so as that filter leaves, it's something to see how do people adapt as their personality literally changes right in front of their family's eyes. Well, and I think the other question is, how would we all act different if we let go of the fear of what people think? Because I think that's what a lot of that filter comes down to. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, I, I, um, I never talk about like, what did any one person say in a legacy interview, but because I've done so many of them, I now can spot patterns between people. And one of the questions that I ask people towards the end of the interview, after we've built a good rapport is what was the most difficult lesson to learn that was the most valuable to know? And uh, it was with women answering this question, particularly over the age of about 65, that I started to recognize that there is a really uh, important pattern there because many, many women, not all of course, but maybe 70 to 80% of women, do you have any guess on what they would say like that was the difficult lesson to learn? I mean, based on our previous conversation, it was about what caring what other people think about you. Exactly, exactly. And so what you find is that the these women who I think cared a lot about what people thought of about them because that was their role in the family. It was their role to be a, a good little girl. It was a, their role as they grew into young adulthood. When they became the wife of the family, they often managed the family stories and the man, family persona. And so their job was to be thinking about how can I represent the family to other people in the best way possible. And, you know, the kids might get annoyed with it or, you know, dad might not like that mom doesn't let him tell those stories. But this was an important role they played in, in connecting with the larger community. But I think that that good thing that you can do can completely consume your life where you suddenly stop being who you are and you become an avatar to this perception that you want other people to have. And so there's something that happens around the age of about 65 for women. And that is that they let go of, of worrying so much about what people thought 
and they begin to be somebody else. And it's a, it's a really amazing thing to have seen that pattern among not just farm women, but women in general. Are there any other patterns that you've seen with certain questions um, when you're asking specifically in the ag space, since that's who we're talking to today, are there any specific patterns that you'd like to share about? Yeah, I think the the one that's the most interesting to me, and it's probably shaped my life as a husband um, and a, you know a father, is many many men as they get older say, "I I wish I would have realized earlier that my wife was my partner, that she was my teammate, that she was my that I could rely on her." And I think for a lot of men, particularly in agriculture, particularly of the generation we're talking about. There was just a lot that they thought I should just hold all this in, you know, my fear mm -hmm. about not making payroll, my concerns that I made the wrong investment into these things. They felt like I need to keep this uh, held closely. And it wasn't until much later they realized, no, I had this person who was right next to me saying she was committed to me. And I, I just didn't trust myself or her or us enough to share that. But a lot of men, as they get older, start to realize like, Without this woman, I wouldn't have gotten where I got. And I wish I would have realized how much more I could have leaned on her than I thought before. That's really powerful. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think the greatest gift that I've had from doing these legacy interviews is that you get to get the distilled wisdom of so many people. I, I uh, was saying this over the weekend, I've become completely obsessed with not only planting trees, but thinking way ahead 20 30 years about what will that tree look like where is it going to throw shade what throughout the year and a lot of that came from before i started doing these legacy interviews it was much harder for me to picture what does 30 years look like and will i get to 30 years and and by hearing so many people talk about the long thing long planning the very low time preference they had on how they cared for their family and how they cared about their business it really makes me think like, what can I be doing not to just get something done today, but to have a really long lasting impact on things that I'm going to care about in the future. That's, I'm glad you're having that experience with them. Cause I even feel similarly, even with my podcast, I mean, like we've talked, I've been doing it for almost five years now and it's just you get to hear so much insight and stories, whether it's on the recording or off the recording, it's very eye-opening. So I'm curious, when you're interviewing farmers or ranchers, do you ask like questions related to the business itself or do you try and keep it more personal? And what are oh, some of those key questions you ask if you're willing to share? Yeah, I mean, how could you not? I mean, like that's, so I think one of the big things, we kind of alluded to this in the beginning, it's worth coming back to about what's special about ag. And one of the things that's special about ag is that family and business are much closer tied together than they are in the city. I've also had a chance to interview several like small businesses where that's been multi-generational, whether that's like a carpet cleaning business or a construction business mm -hmm. or, and they have many of the same principles of farming. But when it comes to farming, you know, you can't, you can't talk to a farmer about like their vacations without understanding, Hey, if you've got cattle, there maybe are no vacations. Or mm -hmm. if you're, if you're going to have these cattle, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask somebody that has cattle is tell me about the worst time that you had getting your cattle back in a pen, because everybody has that, right? Like every single person is like, it was pouring down rain. It was my daughter's wedding. The cattle got out and they were, you know, running amok. And so those kind of stories get people in um, that place where they were in a chaotic time, it's talking about the business, it's, it's highlighting these things, and it allows them to really open up and because they're so intertwined. And then you can go into even less chaotic things, but like more of, you know, how did you allocate the duties? How did you think about um, your family's responsibility to the farm? Did, did they, were there expectations that they work on it? What, what was expected of you? So the farm and the family are so intertwined that um, it really benefits me a lot that I've spent so many years in agriculture to be able to ask these kinds of questions. Do any of them share what maybe some of their biggest regrets are for other generations to learn from? You know, I used to ask questions about regrets and I, I don't really ask them 
because I, th I find now that question about um, what was the, you know, what were important lessons to learn? I feel like most of the bad things that happen in life end up ultimately being lessons about what you can do in the future. And when people think of regret, I think there's often a time, there's often like an implication that they did something wrong and they either can't go back and, and redo it or they, they didn't go back and redo it. And so there's something there's something that's moved me away from asking about regret and being a lot more interested in the lessons learned. I like that perspective. I know when I didn't ask anything about regret when I interviewed my grandparents, that's a hard thing to ask your grandparents. That's a hard thing to ask anyone really. And it's like you said, everything comes down to, you know, failing forward or lessons learned or anything along those regards. If yeah, I think I think the, the, the regret question is a really good one when you're a young person and you're trying to figure out what's it like to be a lot older. And so you think about like, well, what if, you know, what mistakes mm -hmm. have I made and, and that kind of thing. But when people are looking back on their lives, it, there's so much richness to like the the constant hero's arc and the hero's arc, which I think is a really important thing to talk about if the hero woke up and their hair was perfect and they got out of bed and the birds were chirping and the sun was shining and everything went great when they went outside and everything went great all day, that is a terrible story that nobody wants to hear. Mm -hmm. The story we want to hear is I woke up and I made this mistake or this thing happened to me and, and then I bounced around and all of these crazy things just kept going and this is what I thought would fix the problem, but then I had to lose that part of myself and become a different person. I had to transform and change. And so the hero's journeys um, involve falling down about making mistakes and about giving yourself a chance to talk about how you overcame that. And ultimately, when you're passing these down to next generations, that's what they need to hear about. They need to hear like, hey, the, the government took all of our family's money and uh, we were left destitute. And what did we do? Well, we didn't just give up. We started cleaning houses and, and started working our way up, bought a pressure washer, started cleaning out hog barns and then worked our way back up. Those are the stories that are gonna give your kids the roadmap to show them what they can do when inevitably bad things will happen. So because you brought up the word hero, sometimes as, especially in our younger age, we idolize our parents or grandparents and forget that they are humans just like we are and that everyone is continually learning and growing. So have you gotten any responses or heard how perspective, how like say a kid's perspective has changed about their parents or grandparents after listening to the interviews? What's Your kind of the- are excellent. These are great. Yeah. What's kind of the response there? So um, the person that usually buys these are not the person that's doing the interview. Oftentimes it's the adult children or a group of kids or a group of cousins get together and they, and they decide to get this. And um, so what happens, actually, this is a pattern I've noticed. If you were one of the siblings that was like, nah, I'm not interested in that. If you guys want to get it for mom and dad, you can. That is the, the, the adult child that feels like a lot of regret about it afterwards when they see the video and they watch it because families watch these videos together a lot of times after we deliver them. And so I get letters from the kids that didn't contribute more than I get letters from even the people that bought it, right? And one of the things it stuck out to me, it happened um, about a year ago, was a woman wrote and said, I... I wasn't an adult until the day I watched that interview you did with my parents and I was 40 years old and I finally realized, no, I'm an adult. And she goes on in the letter to say she thought that her parents, when they were raising her, already knew how to do everything. They already had it all figured out. And so she was sitting there as a parent of two kids feeling like I don't have anything figured out. And, um, and when she realized that her parents were just as lost and confused and trying to figure it out on her own, she realized like, oh no, that actually is the experience of being adult. You don't know what you're doing. You just have to keep getting up and doing it. And so I've had many of these kinds of emails, but that one was one that, that really sticks out to me about like it transformed the stage of life she was in. She no longer thought of herself as a child or, or somebody failing, but just an adult, a, a regular person. 
So if you are really looking at this from that 10,000 foot view, what do you think the biggest impact is when farm families, even if they don't record it, ask these important questions to the older, the senior generation? The, the way that we, the way that modern society has changed for a lot of great reasons. The technology that we have uh, allows us to get on FaceTime with grandma and granddad and share breakfast with them. I was just doing that. I have two little girls. You know, we do FaceTime with grandma and granddad and they get to eat breakfast with them. They get to spend all this time with them. That's great, except for the fact that modern technology doesn't facilitate the types of experiences where you're sitting at grandma or granddad's on their lap or at their foot and you're just listening to the stories that they share impromptu mm -hmm. and you're, you're being a part of that whole fabric. And I think that um, that fabric is so important that I would actually lay at the feet. One of the reasons that young people are having anxiety disorders and depression and um, you know, substance abuse issues is that, they don't know who they are connected to. They don't know what their family has had to overcome. They can look at their parents and their grandparents and see these people were so successful. I look around at interest rates and the things that I'm facing, I can't imagine how I'm going to be that. So it seems hopeless. And I think that when young people are hearing the stories about how things did not always go well and they were very difficult and they had to make choices that were not beautiful or elegant or perfect and they had to make tough decisions that that's what enables you as a young person to look at this chaotic world and say you know i may not have the answers it may look really bleak but when i know what my family has been through then i'm much more able to handle that and and i think that is why it is so important that the movement to get people to tell family stories needs to grow beyond my business and, and other podcasters just being kind of tangentially in, in, interested because I think that it actually changes our culture to have there be such a large disconnect between the generations and young people not knowing what are you capable of enduring? What can you do? Where have your people come from to give you that strength when things seem bleak? Well, I think to add to that and just because like family transition planning is so fresh on my mind as my husband and I are now on his family's farm, but even I think about when my dad would openly admit, like when he just impromptu is speaking and he talks about, yeah, when mom and I made that decision 15 years ago, we screwed up. And just knowing that generations before us made mistakes too, but still overcame it. Yeah. And I mean, I think even for succession planning, right? Like it's really good for people to know what did mom and dad do to get this? What happened mm -hmm. along the way? because your farm is going to run into challenges, right? There's the, like, you will have to continue to grow and adapt and knowing not just like, hey, dad said, don't ever sell the farm, right? But like, what did was dad willing to do when it came time for it to be very difficult for him and he wanted to sell the farm? Because then you can start to say like, what could that roadmap be for me? And I think it really brings to life and brings, um, a richness to the way that you can make decisions in the future that are in line with, like we talked about before, the legacy of your family. Um, you have to know that legacy and you have to know it by hearing their stories. That reminded me of something that I asked my grandparents that really opened my eyes. So when one of the questions I was asking my grandparents was, okay, I grew up knowing you as just the cow calf guy who only had enough farm ground to feed his cows because ultimately that's what they liked they liked the cattle right well I asked where did you start and it was well actually we had a few dairy cows and pigs because cattle weren't making money so like everyone else we had a little bit of everything and when we tried this and then that didn't work and we tried this and tried that and they talked about all these little enterprises that they built up, but they were continually trying new things to get where they wanted to go, which I think as we try to become so specialized with what we like, and yes, there are some very diverse operations out there, but sometimes we forget when we get 
caught up in legacy and tradition that one thing I always say is the pioneers were innovators. That's what got them to, that's what made, help them survive. And we can't forget that. So I think it's important to ask your family members, what did the operation look like? You know, what different businesses did you try just to see that it hasn't always been the same? I love that. I, th I think that is a hundred percent the case, like with successful people, they, they tried things and they gave up on them or they let them go. They were willing to be experimental. Those are the people, mm -hmm. the families really, that seem to me to be the most robust, the ones that are able to just try things out and, and, you know, you tried a country store and it didn't work. Well, maybe we should never do a country store again, or maybe we should do it again. Only this time do it in another mm -hmm. way. And it's a really powerful thing when uh, the children or grandchildren understand that the family, it wasn't automatic that, that every decision they made worked and, and was perfect because it never was. Nobody's families was. Right. All right, Vance. Well, as we kind of wrap up our time here today, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with the listeners out there? I think that my biggest thought is I, I actually was just a guy called me up today from California and he saw my legacy interviews business and he was like, I was actually thinking about starting something like this. Would you mind giving me some information and helping me get started? And I'm like, yes, I will help. Because even though he could be a competitor, my bigger belief is that stories matter, particularly in agriculture, which I think the stories make up our culture of who we were, who we are how we handled problems, how we got along as a community. And so if legacy interviews isn't something you can do to bring your family out to St. Louis or to have me come out to you, um, to your farm, um, that's okay. Just make sure that you're asking questions and you're improving. And one of the things we've done on our blog, the legacy interviews blog, is mm -hmm. to try and write up like, hey, these are good questions to ask people when you're getting started. Hey, these are ways that you can do it because I believe that it is critically important for our nation's future that these stories um, not just get captured and recorded, but they get passed down and uh, we make that connection between generations that seems like it's been growing wider and wider. So just make sure you're, you go home and ask people questions. They don't even have to be older people. You can ask your mm -hmm. spouse, you can ask your kids. Just have people tell you their stories about what they've experienced and what they've learned. All right. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today. And I'm very excited to push this out to the audience. And I will be sure to include a link to your website in the description for anyone who's interested. Thank you so much, Shay. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on that one. Thank you again, Vance, for taking time to be on the show. I really appreciate it. And I think this serves as a reminder for everyone that nothing beats that in-person connection, asking those questions and really sharing those stories. They matter, they're beneficial. So whether you look into booking a legacy interview for yourself by using the link that I supplied in the description, or if you wanna do that, your, um, do your own form, I would really encourage you all to do it. Like I said in the interview, it's something that I personally did for myself and my family, and it's been so beneficial. So, and very meaningful and something that I really treasure just to have. So with that, have a great rest of your day and happy ranching folks.